I think we're ready to start, Peter. We can just go. Okay, I'm aware of time. Good. So welcome, everybody. Let's go to the next. Yes. So just to remind you all that uh, um, we're recording this meeting. Um, can we go to the next slide, Stephen? Let's keep on going. Good. So that's the tech. That's what I'd like you to do. You've all been posting very nicely. The, the, the test, um, your greetings and hellos. Now, I'd like you to think for a moment before we go on. I'd like to just think you think for a moment about the topic of today. And I'm posting a chat comment. And I'd like you to post if you can. What do you think a positive or negative effect climate change will have on plant health? If I can see everyone's posting messages like mad. So I've just posted a question in the chat. Please post quickly, just take 10 seconds. What do you think a positive or negative effect climate change will have on plant health? This is just our warm up. You know, this meeting is about climate change. So we're going to warm up the conversation. So please post, what do you think? A positive or negative? Resilience is a negative or a positive. Tests, increased pressure, yes. Which is it? Post an example, reduce diversity. Ah, you're posting so quickly, I can hardly keep up. That's good. Less pressure. Okay, disease outbreaks. Less dispersal, good. Positive. Super, super, good. Okay, so that gives us our little uh, warm up. Keep on posting, please. Um, I can't keep up with all the reading. Let's go on to the next slide, please, Stephen. Good, so let me just introduce very briefly. This is the first in a series of four webinars. Today, we're focusing on plant health and climate change. Um, what we're gonna to try to do in the next two hours is to, is to inform you. We have a great panel of people who are gonna share with you some um, what's happening, what are some of the changes we're seeing, what some of the issues are. We're gonna illustrate that we want to inspire you and we want to organize some interaction. So you will be listening for some of the time, but you will also, I hope, be interacting via the chat, but also we have some group sessions. Um, as you know, the, the International Year of Plant Health was from 2020, but due to the COVID pandemic, it's been also stretched or moved to this year. So we're also hoping to really spark the engagement and conversations for the first plant health conference in Helsinki in, this, in the European summer of 2021. Okay, next slide, please. So what do you expect? We have eight short contributions. Um, we would like you to practice active listening and active interaction using the chat. So as we move through the sessions, the speakers will talk we don't really have an opportunity. We are too many people to ask questions in the plenary and to, and to ask audio questions. So if you have a comment or a question, post it into the chat and our speakers have, will, will respond to you. We will have a breakout group exercise around four questions. We will be encouraging you to chat back, to give some feedback after each of the present of the plenary sessions and the moderator will give us her, her own insights as well. A special welcome to our YouTube audience. This meeting is also being uh, streamed on YouTube. You will also have a chance to interact and the whole thing is being recorded and all the slides will be available afterwards. Next slide, please, Stephen. So just to give credit where credit is due, this uh, webinar, although it is being presented as a CGIR webinar, it brings together the International Rice Research Institute together with partners outside the CGIR from FAO, but also ECPay in, based in Nairobi. And there are many other people contributing. The speakers are from far and beyond. You will hear more about them. So that's who the organizers are. Thank you, lady and gentlemen. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is the agenda. We're uh, in the welcome part, the warm up, just to remind you what's coming. We're gonna have the short introduction. We have a nice video in a moment. We have three panels, then we have the groups, and we should finish at 1500 hours, that's GMT. Yeah, so we hope you will stay all the way with us. Um, let's keep on going, please, Stephen. And now I believe we're gonna have a very nice video for you. Hello, I am Abdelbagi Ismail, Principal Scientist and Regional Representative for Africa at the International Rice Research Institute. Human-driven climate change is the challenge of our time. It poses grave threats to the bedrock of any society, agriculture, 
Extreme weather events such as heat, drought, and floods can make plants more vulnerable to pests and diseases and weeds. And changes in local weather patterns can generate conditions favorable for the spread of these plant pests and diseases. Also robs us of the native genetic resources, potential sources of resistant genes to combat these threats. We know that climate change will seriously affect small-scale farmers' households throughout the developing world. In South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, smallholder communities are the most vulnerable to food insecurity with little cushions to adjust to shocks. I'm called Molly Adhiambo Osita. I come from Awendo. I'm a farmer. I grow maize, bananas, vegetables right now, and we're also growing uh, sweet potatoes. And right now, I'm taking care of 15 orphans. Uh, I'm now surprised because of the climate change, which has affected me so seriously. And not only me, uh, farmers around this by area. We have noticed that they are even uh, some thefts, which has now become because of climate change, like staggering, there is fall army one. We don't know whether we'll get uh, a mess like before because of the, the climate change. We are still trying to also to tell other farmers to try to cope with it the way we are doing it. We are trying to pull now and we are seeing there is a change. Many of climate change's impact are already being felt by people like Molly. We must scale up global efforts to understand the impacts of climate change on plant health in order to design effective mitigation and adaptation strategies. The food security and livelihoods of current and future generations depend on it. Thank you, Stephen. Um, some small challenges with connectivity there. Good. So I would like now to, without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's moderator. We're very lucky today to have Dr. Sonja Vermeulen with us. She will be in making some welcome remarks and also um, managing the panels. She's the director of programs at the CGIR System Management Organization, where she leads the team that deliver the CGIR's current and planned research portfolio. She's previously worked for the World Wildlife Fund and at Chatham House in London. And I think what's particularly relevant today, she spent six years as head of research at the CGIR Research Programme on Climate Change, Agriculture and Food Security. So she's the perfect person to be with us today. Sonia, over to you. Thank you, Peter. And good morning, afternoon and evening, everyone. We're really pleased to have you here today. So CGIR, the world's largest agricultural research for development network, welcomes you to the series of webinars entitled Unleashing the Potential of Plant Health. Now, this week, CGIR launched a new strategy, which was introduced and tweeted by Bill Gates on Monday to millions of viewers and followers around the world. The new strategy puts much greater focus than ever before on confronting shocks and risks to food and farming systems. These could be market collapses, disease epidemics, the pandemic we're seeing now, and more and more importantly, climate risks. The strategy recognizes that standalone solutions, however brilliant they might be, won't be enough to make food systems resilient. We need whole system solutions that consider plants, animals, ecosystems, and people together. And this is exactly the approach that unleashing the potential of plant health will take. 
These webinars aim to examine the multi-stakeholder actions that we can take to manage plant health risks in the face of climate change. The ultimate goal is to increase farm incomes and to create new jobs and new businesses that benefit poor people, women and youth. The first webinar, Climate Change and Plant Health, Impact, Implications and the Role of Research for Adaptation and Mitigation, outlines how climate change continues to disrupt our ecosystems with knock-on effects for food security, nutrition, environment, gender outcomes and livelihoods. The webinar will then present some examples of how to respond as a whole system, highlighting the role of research and evidence-based policies in providing support to global efforts to manage climate risks to plant health. Now, we recognize the diversity and expertise that is present in the audience. Everyone on the call is an equally important participant in the program today. There won't be a live Q&A um, for the speakers, but we hope to receive your thoughts both through the breakout sessions that will happen after the panel and through the chat function on the live stream. We'll start off today with three panels with speakers, followed by the breakout sessions for everyone to participate. As we're pressed for time, I ask speakers to respect the time lim limit of eight minutes. And Peter has a little chime that will let you know uh, there are two minutes left in which to wrap up. It's going to be a rich and meaningful discussion. So without further delay, let's begin. Uh, we now move into the first panel on the anticipated impacts of climate change on plant health. And I would like to invite now uh, this first speaker, Henri Tonang, who's the head of data management, modeling and geo information unit at ACPE. Henri, over to you. And Henri, unmute. Is it? Does it need help to unmute something? Okay, I'll ask them to. Okay. Can you hear me now, please? Okay. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, participant. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Peter. First slide, please. In my very short presentation, I will try to present the effect of climate change on insect pests. And the picture that you have there, he tried to show you. Uh, this is not. He tried to display in the first slide. You have the desert locusts that invade East Africa this last year, and the picture exactly shows some part of Ethiopia. Second slide, please. In the second slide, we talk about the complexity and we show a tal of four insects. And the impact of climate change on insects is a very complicated matter. And I will try to illustrate this complexity taking four different modes. What is usually called the noctuous tembora, Bishola fusca, Sesame calamistic and the Chilopatellus, which usually attack maize in sub-Saharan Africa. These pests often, they form a community and live within the same field at the different elevation. It has been observed that high temperature favor Chilopatellus, whereby lower temperature favor Bishola fusca and Sesame calamistic. As such, Temperature it increase, it is caused by climate change, confer an advantage to Chilo over the other mode. As a result, we almost literally see Chilo moving gradually in the higher temperature, attacking maize at high altitude. And this was not observed before, and it can be an effect of climate change. Climate change may also increase the likelihood of massive invasive pests. And I think four years or five years ago, we really witnessed in sub-Saharan Africa, what is called the fall army worm, who is really taking a lot of, who have spread massively in many parts of Africa. 
And there is really a challenge that Folame one may also affect that integrated and interactive system that the Stembora community were formed. Third slide, please. In the third slide, we are trying to look at some limitation in assessing climate change impact on insects. We assume that the effect of climate change on insect pests is huge, but we are only starting to unveil what this effect may be. There are a lot of answers we need to still look for. The first is we have uncertainty in climate predictions. We use model, but those models are not always perfect. There is a dissociation between the plant and the pest himself. And there's insufficient knowledge on the actual yield loss induced by insect. We don't know much about the actual change in the feeding rate, but even less about more indirect bottom top effect, so that change in plant resistance or change in plant palatability, uncertainty about temperature. We are focused more. If you look into literature, there will be a lot of focus on temperature so far. Atropod are ecothermic organism, yes, meaning that the temperature, they track the temperature within the environment they live as such. Temperature change is said to have a massive impact on insect. Temperature increase may, in, may lead to increase in metabolism rate. Temperature increase may lead to the increase in reproduction rate and also in, in, in different change within nature. A paper published in 2018 in Nature by Dutch and Tal used function to predict the global yield of in some major grain and show that there's a potential increase in the global yield loss and those increase may be due to all those factors that we are talking about. However, there is one key factor like CO2 precipitation that has really not been investigated. Be, be investigated. CO2 is totally under research, yet big result of climate change. We are all aware that CO2 is one of the key parameters of climate change. Currently, the level of CO2 is already at 270 ppm, and is expected based on certain scenario that that level can reach even 700 ppm at 2075. I mean, this limited. There's also a limited knowledge in the in the ratio between carbon and hydrogen, and we are aware that this ratio of carbon hydrogen has a very huge impact, a drastic impact on the plant. And as such, we really need to try as much as possible to understand all this potential impact because if a plant is highly affected, it will reduce its nutritious value and the, it can also increase the feeding rate of insect. And there's also very unknown in terms of the impact of precipitation. Little unknown in the diapos. And we are all aware that an increase in temperature may affect the level of diapos because diapos sometimes is caused by very high cool in certain insects. And there's also the issue of fallacy of the average in terms of extreme event. What is the effect of duration and frequency of a strain event in temperature change, for example. We need to investigate all this. The indirect effect of changing climate, for example, what will be the indirect effect of changing in plant growth, in plant growth, in plant metabolism, and also in insect metabolism, as I mentioned earlier. The ecosystem effect, the integral competition, top-down effect, and new invasion, and, and also, we need to bring all together within a berry system, as Sonia announced. I think it's important that we look at all these things holistically. Slide floor, please. There have been 
a, a number of many attempts using different type of models, statistical, phenology, differential equation. Sometimes people even use fractal technique to assess the impact of climate change. However, the majority of known insect pest modeling approach are not holistic. The only, the only concentrate of a single component of a system, for, for example, the pest, rather than the whole system. We believe to properly understand the entire impact, we need to look at it holistically and integrate all the different components that is involved in crop production. Slide five, please. We need to change that and embark in an holistic and systemic insect modeling within a whole context. And we were privileged to have to win the grand challenge. And we are trying to look at some of these components combined within the grand challenge, where we are looking into the temperature change compacted with the CO2. And what is the potential outcome we are looking into in this grand challenge program? The pest population dynamic model and its interaction with the host and environment. We intend to build that type of relationship to see how the temperature combined with the CO2 will be able to affect the, the, the plant itself. How the damage, the amount of damage will be compacted by the plant or will be impacted by the plant due to this combined effect. And we also intend to create a sort of a linkages between the temperature and the CO2 and the overall crop yield law and conduct a lot of scenarios analysis to enhance the understanding on how the duality of two climate components can affect the overall yield loss. Slide six, please. I started with diesel locus. I think it is important that I also end with diesel locus. We know that climate change will impact pets, but we are only starting to quantify the effect of climate change, as I've said earlier. I want to end with the illustration of the enormous effect that climate change may already have been doing in the African continent in an unusual way with the picture that my first slide illustrated. The desert local is not new. It's already referred in the Bible. It has, however, been forgotten. The last Desert locust invasion in East Africa is almost 70 years old. And in 2020, we got some very unprecedented and massive outbreak, and it's expected that it may continue this year. One of the key things that has favored this onslaught of desert locust started with a massive cyclone on the Arab Peninsula dated 2018. Arguably, this cyclone intensified was caused by the rays in the sea level. So it goes to say that climate change can have a massive indirect impact and changing pest population. In this case, sea level rise in the way that has happened as in certain level trigger the massive outbreak of desert locals. We tried to use some machine learning techniques, as you see in those figures, to predict the potential breeding site of these desert locals in different regions of East Africa. And we were able to find out that some regions like Kenya, for example, has some high potential of becoming like a permanent region that need constant monitoring in, in order to control the desert locals, especially in this changing climate. Henri, can, can we ask you to draw to a close? It's been 12 minutes now. Okay, thank you very much. I think this is the end of my presentation. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Henri. Um, so, so we've heard we've heard from um, Dr. Tonang about pests um, and.
the impacts of climate change there. We're going to move now into looking at plant diseases and climate change. And on this topic, I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Karen Garrett, who's preeminent professor of plant pathology at the University of Florida. Karen, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, join this discussion today. If I could have my first slide, please. Yeah, so um, thanks to Henri for setting the scene. A lot of the issues um, for predicting risk are, are the same for insects and plant diseases. So that's one of our big challenges is to understand where risk will change. Um, management is often a challenge already without a change. And then with climate change, we need to understand how we shift our um, strategies for disease management. Next slide, please. Yeah, so when we think about those changes in risk, um, one important uh, consideration for the community is how we can integrate global databases and global models for interpreting them to have the best strategies in place. So to proactively evaluate where risk is changing, where diseases are becoming more important for surveillance, as well as um, future predictions uh, so that we can anticipate in advance and the global cooperation to help with all, putting all these goals into place for the community. So for example, within CGIAR, there's um, the platform for big data and agriculture, which can be key for this sort of global integration. And then a lot of universities, like my own university, uh, University of Florida, um, can, be great, uh, can make great contributions to this as well. For example, University of Florida has a new artificial intelligence initiative. And I think a lot of institutions are um, investing in that as well. Uh, next, please. So as well as changes based on climate or weather um, changes, uh, we can also think for other pests and uh, pathogens that one of the most important risks is from movement into new areas. So of course, if we can avoid having a pathogen even present in a region, that's the best management of all, right? So some important examples of movement these days are fusarium wilt caused by tropical race four, which uh, can attack new cultivars that were previously safe from that disease and also cassava mosaic disease moving through Africa and also moving through Asia now. And another aspect of climate change is, uh, and as it affects these risks, is that when there are extreme weather events that cause crises, the movement of uh, uh, planting materials and food can introduce pathogens into new regions. So that's another sort of risk that we need to take into account. Next, please. Yeah, here's one proposal for how to integrate across uh, uh, global communities to have uh, global cooperation for a surveillance system for crop diseases to understand where they're uh, becoming more important, where they've been introduced, and uh, to integrate uh, models of where they will become more important. Uh, next slide, please. And one thing that we can do to counterbalance and uh, integrate with uh, models of changed risk based on climate is also changed risk uh, based on cropping patterns and how they affect cropland connectivity. So that's one of our interests in, and uh, collaborating with CG scientists uh, to look at how the spatial distribution of croplands influences risk and then how that combines with risk due to climate. So the idea here is that with some of these simpler models like cropland connectivity, those can be the first stages as more is learned about a pathogen that's on the move and the risks that it poses. Next, please. I think that this is a really interesting study. Uh, again, lots of CGIR scientists involved in this, um, looking at what, what limits pest management adoption. And, and one striking, uh, outcome of this is that we see that outreach weakness is often a significant limiting factor. So even if we have tools available, one concern is just whether people are able to access them and choose to adopt them. Next, please. So here's a framework that, that uh, we've been working on a lot, impact network analysis. And I think it offers a useful way of looking at regional management systems. 
So the idea being that there's a management technology available for adoption. And then this upper level of this diagram, um, the points there, the nodes there represent farmers and the other um, types of stakeholders that they interact with. So farmers are deciding whether to adapt a technology or not based on, of course, a lot of different kinds of exchanges and influences. And then the bottom layer there, the biophysical network, um, the movement of pathogens through the system. And then the, the links between those two layers then are where the farmer in the upper level is managing a farm in the lower level and doing a better or worse job of managing the, the pathogens and vectors and insect pests moving through that system. So we can think of those as a combined system that then influences the regional outcomes. And so, so we're advancing in our package to support analysis of this type of system to offer decision support through scenario analysis. Since it's not enough to have a good management tool available, it's also important that it be implemented in effectively in a landscape like this. Next, please. Yeah, and here's, uh, here's another sort of map of the resources that we have available for addressing plant diseases and increased risk of plant diseases. So uh, the rows here are indicating the status of, of a, um, a management tool in terms of whether they're rival or non-rival. In other words, whether they can be used up or not. And of course, one thing we'd like to do is push things like disease resistance genes and, and um, pesticides into the non-rival category to, to work against having antibiotic resistance and to make resistance genes more durable. And then the columns here are exclusive versus non-exclusive. So, so resources that are publicly available versus resources that are private. And so there we want to think about having a good balance between, for example, publicly available data and models that are used for disease management. But we might want to keep some balance with private data and models um, to include the economic incentive as well. So I, I think that this is a good point for discussion in terms of how we can um, form our strategy best in terms of how to use these resources. Uh, next, please. Yeah, and when, when available, the best management strategy is often to use resistant varieties, but this is again an argument for, for making sure that we can anticipate where risk will change since there's a lag in making varieties available that are adapted to a particular region um, as we realize that a new disease is becoming absent there. So for example, the work of CGIR Excellence in Breeding Program to, to make sure that varieties are adapted to a region and the needs of the people in the region. And then also the, um, the seed systems need to be in place to make sure that the distribution occurs effectively and I'll just mention the launch event coming up March 2nd for the RTB Seed System Toolbox, a set of tools for making sure uh, uh, the design and implementation of seed systems uh, can work effectively. Uh, next, please. Yeah, and also we can think about um, we can also think about uh, the crop breeding networks and whether they work effectively uh, to distribute the materials as they're needed through these systems. So another interesting perspective. Um, and actually, in some ways, a new area of study. So how well do are the genetic resources deployed where they need to be? Next, please. And some final potential points for discussion, summing up some of these issues. So the idea that we need to work on um, strengthening through new opportunities for data integration and analysis, uh, phytosanitary capacity, the ability to diagnose and formulate smart surveillance strategies, uh, planning for mitigating pathogen spread, for example, through scenario models, and um, Finally, making sure that resistant varieties and other management technologies are available and accessible and as an affordable tool to farmers. So thank you very much. Thanks very much in, indeed, Karen. And we can see many um, reflections on the chat that, that people are noting the spread of diseases like the fusarium wilt or pests like fall armyworm um, in, in, in their own parts of the world. So interesting to track that in the chat. And others have also been asking um, for the presentations to be made available. Um, and I'm, I'm sure this will be possible and, and will be announced by the organizers. We'll now turn to our third and final speaker on this panel, um, who's 
who's Achim Doberman, um, who's the chief, inter, uh, chief scientist at the International Fertilizer Association, to take us into the plant nutrition angle. Um, take it away, please, Achim. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Can I have my first slide, please? Uh, yeah, I wanted to share just a few points with you from the point of plant nutrition angle. Uh, both in my role now working for the world's largest uh, industry association that deals with this EFA, but also representing a new scientific panel on responsible plant nutrition, where we have 11 independent experts. And we have recently published a, an issue brief on a new paradigm for plant nutrition and climate change uh, plays a significant role in this too. Because what you see on the left side here in this picture is the old paradigm. Uh, so you can see the brown dots, the line there is uh, crop plant knowledge at output, or if you wish, yield, you know, which has steadily increased over the last 60 years, but even more so has increased the use of fertilizer. So the orange dots on the top line there. Uh, and that has actually often increased faster, particularly in the 1970s and 80s and 90s uh, than the output. And the, it has resulted in a significant surplus of nitrogen and uh, fertilizer, particularly nitrogen, is uh, considered to be one of obviously the key uh, contributors to agricultural greenhouse gas emissions, particularly nit nitrous oxide. So we have an input that is critical for intensification, but at the same time also has an uh, impact on climate uh, change. And at the same time, crops uh, that utilize this input, which uh, are impacted by whatever the consequences of the climate change are. Please, the next slide. And, uh, unfortunately, these developments uh, have uh, not been the same all over the world. And so we have now a situation that uh, in this old paradigm that has uh, driven agriculture, uh, we have essentially a divide, a global divide. We have regions in which we have a massive surplus of nutrients, so the red ones and dark red ones and brown ones. And we have large areas, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, but not only there, where the nitrogen surplus and often also that of other nutrients uh, is much smaller, or even we have deficits and we have serious mining of nutrients from the soils. Now, the impact of that uh, will get exaggerated even further under the influence of climate change. So we can obviously assume that uh, soils that have been exhausted for decades of their nutrients will be much more susceptible of uh, any impact uh, uh, from rising temperatures uh, that affect uh, climatic extremes in crops, uh, but also the longer term climate change. Next slide, please. And what we uh, first need to, I think, remind ourselves uh, is, of, is that uh, climate change is essentially a multifactorial crop stress. You've heard a lot about uh, biotic stresses already from the previous two speakers, so I won't repeat this. Uh, but uh, it is essentially also uh, impacting many abiotic uh, factors that drive uh, and affect the farmer's performance in terms of their cropping systems, uh, but also individual crops grown. What we do know is that climate change has both positive as well as negative impacts uh, on crops. Uh, uh, often these are not very well understood. So and generally speaking, we assume that the negative impacts are overweigh the or outweigh the positive ones. But I think in every I think the situation in an agricultural system in the world, this will be slightly different. So on the positive side, we can, of course, assume that the uh, rising carbon dioxide uh, uh, concentrations uh, could uh, increase yields because of higher photosynthesis rates. You know, the scientific studies and open air enrichment systems show that. You know. Or another positive impact could be that uh, in northern climates, uh, growing season may shift and could actually be longer uh, and could actually, um, in certain areas, move from growing one crop a year to two crops a year, or from growing two to three, or different crops that you haven't been able to grow. These are interesting positive uh, changes that might happen. Yeah? But on the other hand, we have uh, a lot of negative ones uh, that concern us, uh, particularly in the global south, where we usually are going to be affected by increases in droughts, heat stress, flooding risks, uh, 
or in some situations also crop damages that result from uh, extreme levels of uh, solar radiation. So we know uh, that uh, in many of these uh, circumstances, uh, mineral nutrients uh, in the plant and how we nurture the plants uh, can play a significant role in mitigating many of these abiotic and also along with that uh, biotic stresses in crops. And a huge numbers of examples for, of that in the literature for different nutrients and the role they play in mitigating these stresses uh, and so lots of resilience to increased uh, climate shocks. That I think is a, a body of knowledge that has accumulated. There's still massive amounts of information gaps uh, that we need to overcome in, in the next uh, decades. Uh, but I think we have enough to work with that actually could allow us to state that if we manage nutrients well, we have an important tool at our fingertips uh, that we can use to mitigate uh, against the potential negative impacts of climate change. And in many ways, go even beyond the pure adaptation of crops and cropping systems to those changes. What this will require as a game changer is uh, that we will in the future have a much greater precision need for managing these nutrients, um, largely also because uh, climate change will increase uh, in a more dynamic manner and more variable manner risks and seasonality of particular changes uh, that are happening. So we need to be able to tailor plant nutrition solutions to the circumstances uh, in every crop and every cropping season at a local level that is really relevant for agronomic management by farmers. My last slide, please. And that forms the basis uh, for what I want to conclude with, uh, uh, the new paradigm of responsible or sustainable plant nutrition. I don't have time to go through this in detail. I have a web link here at the bottom right that I encourage you to look at, uh, to actually read this in more detail. We view plant nutrition in the future much more than just increasing productivity and yields of crops. We see it as a system solution, as a food system solution that while increasing you know, productivity and making crops and cropping systems more resilient, also needs to uh, meet goals in terms of reducing emissions, you know, reducing pollution of the environment, improving crop nutrition and therefore human health and also animal health, contributing to soil health um, and reducing nutrient waste and increasing the recycling of nutrients. In the report that we have written, uh, we have outlined uh, six uh, key actions that we believe uh, can play a significant role in achieving those five interconnected aims. And so we believe that uh, many of these also are directly either related to climate change from the uh, source side of things. So from the emission point of view, mitigating those as well as to uh, really adapting the future agricultural systems uh, to the potential impact of climate change. I'd be happy to have more discussion on this, but I encourage you to go to the website, read the uh, little issue brief, and contact us also with any further suggestions or questions you have. Thank you. Thank you very much um, indeed, Achim. And um, all, do keep your comments and questions coming in the chat. Um, they can also be dealt with in the breakout sessions that will follow the panels. So, so we've heard now that you know, what is on our side um, is the fact that we are improving um, the way that we're analyzing big data, the way that we're sharing information around the world. And we're becoming much better at that. But on the negative side, we, we face a large number of unknowns, unknowns about the climate, particularly their extremes, unknown about the crops, the physiology of the uh, pests um, and of the diseases. So there's a lot of research ahead. There's a lot of work for us as a research community to do. And I think importantly, it's, it's not just on the biophysical side, uh, as, as we've heard from our speakers. It's also about understanding farmers' behaviours, how they take up information um, and new technologies and approaches. So thank you very much to the three speakers and, and to those of you who, who've been um, putting material into the chat. 
We'll move now to the next panel, which is on implications for food security and nutrition, for gender and livelihoods, and for the environment. And with this, I, I welcome our first speaker, um, Schengen Fan, who is a professor and dean on global food economics and policy at, at China Agricultural University, and is also a member of the CGR system board and has been at a board meeting today. Um, over to you, Schengen, please. Thank you, Sonia. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depend, depending on where you are. Uh, I wanted to emphasize how important the pan health is in terms of global food security. Because of the diseases and the pests, we lose about 20 to 40% of our food crops. Could you imagine how much food we have lost? How many people can feed with that lost food? So in the meantime, you can see we have almost 800 million people suffering from hunger and 2 billion people suffer from hidden hunger, lack of micronutrients. So the climate change will make this even worse. So more crops will be lost due to more pests, more diseases. And in addition to that, the nutrition content of many food crops will also decline due to climate change. So we are already facing lack of micronutrients for billions and billions of people. Then the food safety. We know that when the weather is wet and then the fungus could happen, after toxin can happen, so food safety could be compromised. Now we know that because of the climate change, because of the health concern, many people will begin to move towards a more plant-based diet, which may require more and high quality plant-based foods. So let's remember that. So there's a huge demand for better, high quality, nutritious, safe, plant-based foods. So what should we do? I think the key is innovation. Innovation in technology. We know that certain technology like a GMO you know, can help to defend against certain pests, certain diseases. Then in terms of fertilizer innovation, I think Akin has said very well, but in terms of pesticides, there are also enough innovations that are here in China, the China Agriculture University. You know, they innovate organic fertilizers, highly effective, but in the meantime, less toxic. So farmers can use less pesticides, so less pollution, less negative impact on our environment, on our health. Now, in terms of nutrition, you must know that CGI has a very large research program to add micronutrients into our food crops, the biofortification. So 40 million people already consuming biofortified foods. So with enriched iron, zinc, vitamin A in their diets. Now, aflatoxin, CGI has a program called uh, the um, AgriSafe, under A4H, Agriculture for Nutrition and Health, and ITA. So using that technology, many effects of the aflatoxin can be eliminated or avoided. Now I wanted to emphasize the importance of policy in solving this problem. Now, how can we really reduce the impact from pests, from the diseases? Number one is that we, do, we need to understand the cost of benefit. You know, if we lose quite a bit of food every, every year, 20%, 40%, so it is a food security problem. It is also an economic problem. You, know, you can calculate the cost and the benefit. And if, if we invest you know, R&D to addressing that issue, I think the returns is, is tremendously, tremendously high. So I would suggest somebody can do research on where we can invest, how we can invest in reducing the impact from pests and the diseases. Now, the trade policy, yes, trade, we can increase the capacity of our trade to make sure that all these pests, disease do not cross the border, you know, called uh, sanitary and uh, photosanitary standards. Capacity needs to be beefed, but also make sure that the countries do not use this as an excuse against free trade, against trade. If people depend on trade to feed themselves, people depend on trade 
make a living. The farmers may suffer, consumers may suffer from trade barriers. So let's keep that balance in our mind. I think finally, consumer behavior. The consumers, if they know the food they consume is safe, nutritious, healthy, free of pests, free of, let's say, pesticides, they would demand the whole value chain, drive the whole value chain, you know, from production to transportation to processing, the whole value chain to make sure that our, plan, our plants are healthy, the foods produced are healthy, nutritious, and through the whole value chain, the consumer final consumption will consume healthy and nutritious foods. So I wanted to end over here. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank you. much indeed, um, Schengen, um, for your introduction around food security and nutrition. We're going to cover a breadth of issues on this panel. So we'll now look at the implications for gender and livelihoods. And so we turn to the International Food Policy Research Institute's Director for A Africa, Dr. Jemima Njuki. Jemima, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Sonia. Um, very glad to be part of this important panel. I want to talk about climate change, uh, plant health, and gender inequality. And as you know, there have been a lot of concerns about inequalities um, exacerbated more by climate change and other pandemics like COVID-19. Now, the available evidence we have indicates that the relationship between inequality and climate change is actually characterized by what you would call a vicious cycle, um, whereby initial inequality causes marginalized disadvantaged groups to suffer disproportionately from the adverse effects of climate change resulting in even greater subsequent inequality. And so we need to break this chain. So there are three main channels through which plant health, um, through which inequality aggravating effects of climate change materialize. Um, namely, the increase in exposure of groups of people to the adverse effects of climate change, um, increasing their susceptibility to damage caused by climate change, and this could include uh, damage to crops uh, or in general uh, plant health, and a decrease in their ability to cope and recover from the damages uh, suffered. So I wanna talk specifically about three levels of impact. If you could go to the next slide, please. I wanna talk about the, the intra-household dynamics and how um, the, you know, the impacts of climate change are felt differently within, within households. So we know gender and household relationships shape how people are impacted by and respond to climatic changes. Now, one of the things that we have evidence of from from research in, in IFPRI shows that in times of crisis, women's assets are often first uh, to be sold and therefore um, it takes even longer for them to be recovered. So we have evidence, for example, from Uganda and Bangladesh that in cases of all in times of um, weather shocks, that women's assets are eroded, um, eroded faster. We also know that with, with changes in plant health, we are also see, uh, likely to see uh, labor dynamics within households um, changing. The second level, and which Schengen has alluded to briefly, is the household dynamics and the impacts on food security, incomes, livelihoods, and, uh, and, and nutrition, often felt through either change, uh, decreases in food quantity um, and access, and it becomes very important in terms of addressing women's nutrition needs, the nutrition needs of adolescent um, girls or children in the first 1,000 uh, days, but also decreases increases in dietary diversity and even food nutritional content and how uh, climate change might influence, uh, influence that. And the expectation is that uh, impact on plant health can make these impacts worse and, and really looking to how advances in research can also explore some of these issues further. Then the third level is the policy implications. And what we've seen a lot of is um, the imbalance in investments uh, between what would be considered 
key crops in countries versus what would be considered women's crops. Um, and, and we've seen decreased public spending in some of these crops and livestock that are really critical for both women's uh, livelihoods, but also for nutrition. For example, in Kenya, there's a national uh, insurance program that covers um, maize as a key crop in, in the country. And we are working with the government to actually use satellite data, mobile data, to see how to design contracts for crops such as green grams and potatoes that are important for women and that are important for, for nutrition. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, I do want to highlight a, key, a, key, a few key priority issues around gender and climate change and this intersection with uh, plant health that I think are important. Some of these priority issues are actually included in the Lima uh, program of work from um, COP that has uh, then transitioned into an action plan that countries are implementing. And the first one is close, closing the technology gap and, and, and these policy uh, investments. So technologies such as climate change, agriculture techniques, water management, access to financial services, advisory services that are targeted at women. We do have a lot of evidence here on what, uh, what works for for example, in making sure that women have access to, to, to extension services or technologies, mechanization that can address drudgery of work. The second one is strengthening women's agency and capacities for dealing with uh, both plant health impacts and, and climate change. And I want to emphasize here that agency works at both the individual level um, and, and at collective level, because in context of stress where choices are limited, it is often expressed very, uh, very collectively, for example, with groups uh, of women engaging in labor or asset sharing um, arrangements. But to say that um, agency doesn't just refer to skills and capacities, but also to the aspirations that uh, both men and women women have in terms of their livelihood uh, decisions. Um, we need to understand these aspirations and imaginings for the future and indeed their time horizons and time preferences so that we can understand why they make the choices that they, uh, that they make. And this is especially true for young women because they are often overburdened with responsibilities, yes, with access to much fewer, uh, fewer resources. So programs that provide skill appropriate opportunities for young women, along with investments in other supportive infrastructure such as childcare, health and education facilities can actually increase the range of adaptation possibilities that is available to them. We need to increase women's leadership and, and voice. And I think that's quite explanatory. We know there are their, their gaps, uh, gaps there. We need to address gendered social norms. Uh, so in initiatives, interventions, focusing on both women and men as agents of change to challenge some of the underlying causes of, of, of inequality, as well as changing some of our governance structures including land uh, land governance and finally data to inform policies and decisions i think uh, other speakers have talked about the need for research and 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 evidence there are some efforts here to increase the collection of sex disaggregated data if pre has developed the women's empowerment in agriculture index it is now being um, changed to enable it to collect data at, at national level as part of the 20 by 30 initiative. And we are hoping that that starts getting rolled out uh, across countries. And in closing one minute, I would like to say that uh, we know there are two broad narratives at play in relation to gendered vulnerabilities and, uh, and adaptation, women as marginalized, but also women as agents of change. And we need to interrogate these, uh, both of these narratives, but also look at some of the the complex and intersecting power relations that might not enable men and women to, to, to act. Thank you very much. Back to you, Sonia. 
Thanks very much indeed, Jemima. Um, we now turn our attention to the environment and we welcome now as our next speaker, Juliana Jaramillo, who's the theme lead for sustainable agriculture at the Rainforest Alliance. Ju Juliana, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. And good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening to everyone that uh, is here uh, listening. Um, I would like to present, uh, Sonia said, the, the implications on the environment of, of climate change and, and plant health. The next slide, please. Okay, so let me start with, uh, with an example to, to illustrate the, the effects at uh, different levels. And I take an example here of coffee and its uh, main uh, insect pest, the coffee berry border. And then we can see that a, a, a tiny min minute insect of um, uh, like less than two uh, millimeters uh, can have an impact that are felt at a landscape level. So we see, for example, as an individual, uh, the coffee plant is affected by, by climate change but also the increased temperatures and humidity lead to higher damage a number of generations per year of the coffee berry border, which at the system level then um, uh, leads to a higher rate of dispersion and number of trees being attacked, uh, crop losses, uh, increased crop production costs, and uh, a point here that is uh, potentially higher pollution, pollution through more insecticide applications and potentially uh, uh, insect resistance. So we can see that this effect starts to go up. And then if we move to the landscape level, uh, we have that an increased distribution range of the pest, either latitudinal or altitudinal, uh, can lead to, for example, migrations of, um, of farmers uh, leading to poverty and um, ultimately deforestation and biodiversity loss at, uh, at the landscape level uh, because of farmers looking for new regions to, to grow their crops. Next slide, please. So now if we uh, look a little bit in detail about the, the implications and also about the solutions and, and po possible vehicles to scale these solutions, we have that at the individual level, we, we have the effects of, on plant physiology and, uh, in general and higher susceptibility to pests and diseases, for example. And at, at the system level, we have effects on, on soil health, water and nutrient cycling and plant productivity. And then we have, as we have seen, the, the implications at the landscape level on livelihoods, local economies, because of uh, different suitabilities of crops uh, and uh, problems of decoupling, decoupling, for example, of pests and, and natural enemies. Now, some of the solutions uh, we, we have talked about here that my uh, colleague speak, speakers here have talked about is if the plant, for example, plant breeding can be a very good uh, solution or, for example, early warning systems of pests and diseases or something that has been neglected, which is like a real definition of threshold levels of pests, for example, that will help uh, in the adoption of, of IPM. When, when we see in, in practice, for example, we want to give recommendations to farmers about how to implement uh, IPM, we see that the, the, the threshold levels are, are largely lacking, for example. Now, at a system level, uh, it would be to identify and prioritize relevant climate smart agriculture practices and regenerative agriculture, but also to analyze the costs and benefits uh, because without uh, the economic incentives, it's very difficult to uh, upscale uh, adoption. And then at a, at a landscape level, we have um, the climate change impacts, for example, to understand the risk of, of, of the climate change over time, so the suitability. And if we look, for example, the, the vehicles to scale the solution is, we find that uh, apart from research, is very important. Capacity building is crucial that the knowledge is really be tra being transferred uh, to, to, the, to the people in the field, but also improved uh, access to information, to markets, to finance, et cetera. Uh, sustainability standards like the Rainforest Alliance can, can also play a, a part, uh, but also um, taking, taking into account the, the concept of shared responsibility uh, because uh, the burden 
it shouldn't fall all on, on farmer's shoulders and needs to be distributed along the supply chain. And I will now like to talk about one of the possible solutions that we believe may have a big impact on all levels, and this is regenerative agriculture. Next slide, please. So regenerative agriculture um, has some definitions uh, out there, but for the, for the Rainforest Alliance, is a broad set of principles and practices, all under, under the umbrella of climate smart agriculture, uh, because in order to, to reach a point where farms are truly regenerative, one has to take in, into consideration that uh, the, the ever increasing impacts of, of climate change. So we have an integrated systems management approach to foster a biodiversity, enhance ecosystem services, and increase agroecosystem resilience, thus leading to uh, resilient livelihoods and an improved adaptive capacity of, at, a, at a landscape. Uh, level. Next, please. So if we look at it here all, all together, um, what kind of impact can be achieved by adopting regenerative agriculture? Well, as mentioned before, our definition of regenerative agriculture implies that it falls under climate smart agriculture. Uh, and what is smart about climate smart agriculture is that the specific threats, whether they be droughts, floods, or rising temperatures, for a given uh, region or crop or even farm, determine the methods to respond to these challenges. That's why uh, here we have a bar uh, of the risk assessment and contextualizations running through at the, at the left of the slide. Then at the individual level or, or at the plot, we focus on healthy soils and an increased plant diversity that leads to healthier crops, nutrient availability, carbon sequestration, uh, for example, and resilience to pests and diseases. Uh, then at a, at a system farm level, the focus is on protecting and managing uh, natural ecosystems and enhancing ecosystem services, for example, agroforestry systems, riparian buffers, etc. And here the Rainforest Alliance standard has mainstream biodiversity conservation in all farming activities. Finally, uh, at a landscape level, the focus is on biodiversity conservation and climate change adaptation and mitigation. Uh, supporting forest connectivity conservation of key natural ecosystems um, and um, the effects on, on the productivity and, and, um, and uh, consequently on livelihoods. Uh, finally, uh, if you would like to know more about uh, our work on climate smart agriculture, next slide please, um, or uh, regenerative agriculture, here are a couple of um, resources for you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Juliana. So we've heard from uh, three speakers in this panel on different topics. Um, and we'd like to ask you to keep sharing your thoughts on, on these topics in, in the chat. Um, and while their topics were very different, I think we've heard some clear commonalities. So whether we're working on food security, nutrition, gender, livelihoods, or environment, there's strong messages to be working at all levels from the individual, the individual farmer, consumer, um, through to the system level at a farm, for instance, and yeah. then up to the landscape or jurisdictional level. Um, there's also a strong message around the enabling environment. And that's in some parts, that's policy, which can be good or bad. So um, enabling policies such as sustainability standards, but we've also heard about the difficulties that policies can pose. For example, if they, present, if they prevent cross-border trade uh, or if they uh, do not provide the incentives to invest in, in women's preferred crops. But policies can also be very, very good. And thinking beyond policy, we can see that the enabling environment also means capacity building, knowledge sharing, some of the soft parts we may not always give sufficient attention to, indeed going as deeply as working on the social norms that we share. So thank you to the second round of panelists. Um, we'll now move to the third and final panel, which looks at what the research community can do. What is the role of research in supporting global efforts um, to both mitigate and adapt to climate change challenges to plant health? 
Our first speaker on the panel is uh, T.R. Sharma, who's Deputy Director General for Crop Sciences at the Indian Council of Agricultural Research. T.R., please, over to you. Thank you, Sonia. Good morning, afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, you're very clear to okay, me. Okay, thank you. Thank Please you very continue. much, Sonia. So can I go to my first slide? Yeah, so I'm going to speak today on the role of national research in providing support to global mitigation and adaptation efforts. As, I to as told by Sonia, I I'm working at Indian Council of Agricultural Research, New Delhi, India. Next slide, please. So the, what I'm going to talk today is uh, in this particular topic about impact assessment, mitigation, adaptation, and how we are going to tackle this type of problems in Indian context. Next slide, please. If we see the sector-wise greenhouse gas emission in India is, then India contributes to 6% of the global greenhouse gas emission, which is fifth in the world. And on, as far as various components are concerned, it is given in this slide. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a very good initiative. We started a few years back, around eight years back, and that is called as National Innovations in Climate Resilient Agriculture, NICRA program with 23 institutes, 121 farm science centers and 11 uh, agriculture technology assessment and research center throughout the country, which work on climate change risk and representative concentration of pathways is given in this particular map of Indian map. Next slide, please. So as far as impact on fish, livestock, and poultry is concerned, you can see that fishery changes in breeding season, but it, it is happening very extensively in an extension of distributional boundaries, vertical as well as horizontal of small pelagics. And then in dairy, we have increase in temperature humidity index, and that is leading to reduced milk production. Under poultry cases, heat stress-related reduction in egg production and increased mortality. This increased production variability due to more frequent drought, floods and heat events. And this is all happening because of large implication of intra and international trades. Next slide, please. Greenhouse gas mitigation technologies, which uh, you can see here, which we are using in the countries, SRI, Drip, which reduces 36% uh, global warming potentials over SRI conventional methods, 22% water savings uh, in SRI drip over SRI conventional aerobic rice reduced uh, global warming potential to 40%. And similarly, rice varieties PB1509 had lowest methane emission, which is a basmati type of variety, which is grown Northwestern Indian states. Next slide, please. So we, we are working on typically on development of climate resilient crop varieties uh, which for which we have developed various wheat genotypes with high yield potential and heat stress tolerance, new rice submergence tolerance genotypes, rice lines for nitrogen use efficiency, and maize genotypes with high yield potential and tolerance to water deficit. Uh, similarly, back black gram germplasm resilient to heat, drought, and photothermal thermal periods have already been developed. And you can see here one of the uh, examples of rice variety CR Dhan 201, which covers around 5.63 lakhs hectares of uh, area under cultivation. And similarly, we have developed many varieties and we are using new genome initiatives in initiative, particularly genome editing for improvement of abiotic stress tolerance in rice and in other crops. Next slide, please. So if you see the program which I was talking about, what is the, its impact during the eight, past eight years, the carbon positive farming, which carbon sink increased, 
from 6 to 96 percent in 51 151 climate resident villages yield and income gain is up to 12 to 36 percent in villages due to adoption of resilient technologies capacity building we have uh, organized around 11,000 odd programs with 4.28 lakh stakeholders, researchers, farmers, policymakers, and politicians across the strata which we people at, uh, attended our programs. Then ups, upscaling uh, climate resilient village model uh, in, in various programs. And you can see here the data is given here from different states like Maharashtra, uh, which is uh, in mid in the central India and then Odisha, Eastern India, Telangana is also South and Karnataka, Southern India and Assam, Mizoram, uh, particularly from Eastern India. So Northeast India. So all these states are being covered under uh, this particular program, which is working very efficiently on climate resilient agriculture. Next slide. So what are the future programs on global climate change in India, which we are working on to establish India flux network for emission inventory, then precision agriculture for the development of technologies for on-farm resource use efficiencies, enhance the area under resource conservation technologies and conservation agriculture, clean energy operation, farm machineries, farm products, processing units, cold storages, then climate resilient varieties, high yield and quality, then biofuel and genome editing, et cetera. All these techniques are being used. In detailed climate change adaptation plans and technology demonstrations and crop insurance, which is being monitored through drone and satellite sensor-based crop monitoring technologies based on which crop insurance is given to the farming community. Next slide, please. So with these words, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to be here this afternoon. And I am happy to be a part of this whole uh, webinar series. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Professor Sharma. And we'll now turn to our last speaker of the day, Ana Maria Loba Guerrero, who will reflect on the opportunities for international research. Ana Maria, please. Thank you very much, Sonia, and thank you for the organizers of the event for inviting me and providing the information to discuss the role of international research in this very important topic. If you could please go to the next slide. So I would just like to start by, by, by emphasizing something that has been said before, and it is that the increase in global temperatures have resulted in a rise in calamities and natural disasters. And something very important is that this rise has been seen not only in frequency, but in severity. And this has caused species of pests and diseases and weeds to appear earlier than usual in the season, and therefore has resulted in greater impacts on plant health. So therefore, addressing the relationship between climate adaptation and plant health needs really to acknowledge the importance of reducing the impact of variable weather and extreme events in plant health. And so my first message that I would like to deliver is that international research has a very important and relevant role to play, especially through the generation of knowledge in relation to these risks in relation to inclusive early warning systems, very important that include pests and diseases, and in general, uh, generating knowledge in relation to climate informed advisors. If you could go to the next slide, please. So what I will do now is just to mention three broad themes where I believe that the international research community has a lot to contribute. And the first one, it's in relation to managing climate-related risks. It is very important to address and understand this challenge of climate and plant health to understand, anticipate, and use this information for decision-making processes in terms of managing these climate-related risks. And in here, the international community has a lot to contribute in terms of advancing the agenda. Something that we have been working in the past, it's how to innovate this climate risk management 
through bundling complementary services. And when I mention bundling, I'm thinking about climate information plus technical advisories plus pest and disease early warnings. And by bundling, by putting all of these things together, what we have observed is that tools such as insurance are easier to get to many smallholder farmers so that they can benefit from this. We could go to the next slide. So the next broad theme that it is important, and this has been mentioned before today, it's uh, the importance of crop breeding to address these challenges in relation to climate and plant health. The truth is that the rate of climate change is already outstripping our ability to adapt through traditional crop breeding. And therefore, we really need to develop new varieties that are more resilient and that consider what we have called these secondary effects of a warmer world. And this includes new pests and diseases. But the fact is that new varieties alone are not going to make the case. We need breeding strategies that integrate seamlessly with delivery systems to really benefit from these new varieties. And in here, the international community, the international research community has an important role in terms of advancing for institutional and policy work for these breeding strategies. And this is related to thinking about seed systems, index specs, insurance, mechanisms to empower farmers so they can use these new varieties and very, very important digital advisory systems. And with that, let's connect to the following slide. So the third broad theme that I would like to, to present in here, it's in relation to the digital world that can really become a game changer into really addressing these challenges of climate and plant health. In this slide, what you observe, it's one of many apps that have been developed in the past years. And this one is one that was developed by ECRISAT, one of the CGR centers and partners. It's called Plantix. It is an automatic plant disease uh, recognition tool using smartphones. It goes beyond, beyond recognition. It engages farmers throughout the year. And, and I'm just um, including this example because Plantix has been very successful in terms of reaching scale, which is one of the main barriers of these, uh, of these kind of apps. But in here, the international research community has also a relevant, a relevant role to play in many ways. One of those, and we have been hearing this as well today, it's in terms of um, global data sets and promoting the sharing of scientific image data globally. So, you know, the pace, the pace at which pests and diseases are increasing, it's, it's very hard to have these apps updated. And by promoting this sharing of scientific data globally, we can respond better to this challenge. The second one, it's in relation to the, the international research community has a lot to say in terms of demonstrating the business case for these tools, for this digital agriculture, so that uh, investments can be channeled to promote these kind of tools and to, uh, and to help to scale them. If you go to the following slide, uh, and this one and these three last slides are, are they, they are, they relate to a broader research agenda, not only in relation to um, climate change and plant health, but of course, climate change and plant health can benefit from these reflections. And this slide that you're seeing right now comes from some work that CCAFs, the CGR Research Program on Climate Change, Agriculture and Food Security have done in the past in terms of analyzing which are the levers for really being able to transform food systems under climate change conditions. And one of those relates to doing research in a different way. We are working a, very much in a fragmented way, sometimes inefficiently with duplication, sometimes overly supply based and acting under silos. And therefore it is difficult to deliver end-to-end -end sustainable solutions and scalable solutions. There are many things that have been happening already in terms of you know, having clear theories of change, involving our partners and stakeholders from day one so that they so that they can or all of us together can come up with the key and relevant research questions such as the one that we have been discussing today and very very important being able to measure the success of our research in terms of how we are benefiting society you could go to the following slide 
So this, this slide comes, and, and Sonia already mentioned this, the, the CGR um, strategy for research and innovation was launched two days ago. And this comes from, from this strategy, and it's, it's very relevant for the topic today. And, and as you can see in this slide, there are some uh, impact areas where it is needed a lot of support from the international research, including climate adaptation and mitigation and plant health. But more important than that, international research need to invest in four main things to, to make this transformation happen, in innovations, in partnerships, in capacity development, and in policy engagement. And with that, let me, let's move to my final slide. And in here also, what I would like to recognize is that even though there are, some, there are many strategic actions to really implement this new type of research, generating scientific evidence, which is the fourth one in this slide, is just one of the many. And of course, there's a lot of uncertainties in this agenda of climate change and plant health in terms of generating this knowledge, but we cannot forget about the importance of, at the same time, thinking about the importance of partnerships, innovative finance, and digital revolution, as I, as I mentioned, as, as a really game changer in terms of being able to scale and reach many, many farmers. So let me stop there. Thank you very much. Back to you, Sonia. Thank you very much indeed, Anna Maria. And that brings us to the uh, our final speaker and a wonderful collection um, of, of uh, eight talks that we've had, very wide ranging. Um, please, everybody, do have a look now um, at the chat. Uh, Peter Ballantyne is putting up now the questions that we'd like you to reflect on. These will be the questions discussed in the breakout groups we're about to go to. While he's doing that, while you're reading it, I'll just re reflect on a few of the themes that have been running through both the talks and the chat that we've seen. And there are two that I'd like to pull out. The first is around the pace of change. People have been talking about how rapid climate change is, um, talking about risk, pace, speed. Also, the, the pace at which it's an opportunity that we are able to keep up with it, um, that human beings too are innovating rapidly and changing our approaches to things. The other main theme coming out is, is around uh, doing things collectively. So we've heard words such as bundling, connectivity, networks, data sharing, partnership. Uh, again, it's this kind of approach. We talked at the beginning about taking a whole systems approach, and it's these ideas of bringing multiple disciplines and ways of working together that the uh, speakers and, and those of you in the chat have really brought out as, as being critical to making a, a difference. I'll end there and um, pass over to Peter to introduce the breakout groups. Over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Sonia. Thank you, everybody. And um, thank you for being with us for the last uh, hour and a half or so. We've had some interesting conversations in the chat and a few little, little technical issues, but we're here together. Can I have the next slide, please, uh, Stephen? Okay, so we're going to break now. We've, you've been listening now, and we wanted really to have an opportunity to, to interact and talk about some of these issues. And we're going to use the group feature in, um, group, in Zoom um, to see if we can organize some small group conversations. We've identified four questions where we would like your help to talk about um, these issues. The first one really is what are the research actions that we need to take to tackle plant health, yes? The first is about research. The second one is about delivering and reaching the people on the ground who are really working on planting and growing um, what are the most important actions to ensure that we deliver the practical plant health solutions? The third question is around policy, policy interventions, policy changes. What are necessary to enhance the uptake of plant health innovations? Finally, gender inclusion. What has, actions can we take to overcome gender and inclusion? So I hope you're not going to be leaving. We're going to take about 15 minutes now to have a conversation. And I would like to have a next slide, please. So what we're going to do, we're going to send you into groups. Groups of you will be about eight or 10 people. You will go, you will go into a group automatically in a moment. Um, you will be sent away. You need to talk to yourselves. You need to choose one of those questions. And I'm just right now going to post the questions into the chat. Each question has a link with it to a Google slide. So it's quite challenging. You have to go to a group. You have to decide which question you want to talk. 
uh, about, and you might need to capture the notes, please, in the Google slide. And then when you come back, you, I will ask you to share back your most important uh, insight. So Tundi, let's give people 15 minutes since we they were, we're going good on the time. And everybody, will, you will go to a group, you can talk for a few minutes, please write down or capture some points in relation to one of the four questions. And I have posted them in the chat. I'm gonna post them again as other people are chatting. So choose one, it's about research, it's about delivery, it's about policy or it's inclusion. When you are in your group, if you have a problem, there is a button you can press where it says, we are having a problem. Yeah, there's a help button. Click that button and our colleague Tunde, who is sitting in Nigeria, will jump to your help. So Tunde, over to you. Can you send everybody away? We will all go away and we come back automatically in about 15 minutes. So enjoy your conversations. Tunde. Yes, uh, I've done that. Everyone's gone? Going? Yeah, they are going currently. Yes. Yeah. Good. Let's see how it goes. I can still see we're still 150 people here. Um, presenters, you did a very, very good job. And Sonia did a very, very good job. And the chat was very lively. In, indeed. So so I, I think we still have the presenters here, in, in, here. In, in, in this room. So yes, I so First of all, I'd like to thank all of you. I just, I thought all of you were fantastic, really clear. Your sound was good. You had prepared really well. So uh, uh, enormous thanks from, from our side. Um, we, we, we just have a few minutes together now. I'd certainly like to welcome you all to, in a minute, go and stretch and get a drink or anything else you need to do. But just before we do that, I, I just Peter and I just wanted to check in if in the final summing up there were any things you, you'd particularly encourage us to raise um, that you'd like us to say you think are important summing up points or takeaways. Just one second, Sonia. I believe yeah. everybody's back in the plenary. What happened? That Indeed. Everyone's come back. Yeah. Sorry, groups, you shouldn't be back. You should all be in, in your groups. And we're just double checking what happened there. Tundi sent everybody away, but you've all come back, which is lovely, but you should be in a group. Tundi. Yeah. Just, just a moment. I'll send everybody back. Sorry, everybody, you're going to go back. You're going to go away in a second. And uh, please be thinking about which question you want to tackle. Research, policy, inclusion, or delivery. Yes, we are aware you're all back. You're going to go away again in a minute. Sorry. We, you know, we need to keep you um, awake and thinking. Yes, so choosing. I can see some of you are choosing topics. So when you get to your group, you know what to talk about. Okay. Tundi, how are we doing? Yeah, I'm sending them back to the room now. Okay. Apologies, everybody. Yes, I can see people disappearing now. Yeah, we're down to 120 in our group now. So give them like 15 minutes or so, Tundi. Yes, yeah, I've done that. Super, yeah, they dropped down, so we're down to 50 now, good. Okay, Sonia, back to you, sorry. Yes, well, I, I hope everyone heard me. It was, but before giving you a few minutes to go and refresh yourselves, are, are the, would any of you as speakers like to raise anything in particular that you think is important for the takeaways, the summary that Peter and I will do very briefly at the end? Sonia, this is Schengen. Yeah. I hope you can emphasize how important, how serious is this issue of art. Yeah. You know, we lose quite a bit of food every year. Yeah. Eaten by pests and by yeah. diseases. I think this is serious. So, so yeah. So, and one of the things that I was picking up from the chat that kind of goes with that for me is is people were talking about feeling empowered. Um, by by this webinar today. So, so those kinds of points pair with each other. This is a really important topic. It's time to act, feel empowered, act on it. Okay, thank you, Schenken. 
I think, Sonia, the other thing that, and it's come out towards the end, is the importance of this international cooperation in, in research across <laughs> the globe, but also across different groups, whether they're CGIR centers or national research organizations, yep. but also making sure that that research actually gets to the people that need it most, that it has to link to robust, inclusive extension systems so that yep. it's reaching yep. um, where, where it's needed to make a difference. Thanks so much, Jemima. Okay. Robust, inclusive. I'm going to use your exact words. <laughs> <laughs> Extension systems. That's 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 still a key, a key, a key yeah. missing piece, isn't it? That even as research evolves, our extension systems are, are not as strong as they were yeah. a couple of years ago to be able to reach people, the people that need the knowledge and the and yeah. the research. Yeah. yeah, I thought it was helpful that Anna Maria talked about digital tools for bridging yeah. that divide as well. Okay, any anybody else? I mean, obviously we won't have a lot of time, but we've got two nice big points there. Uh, can I can I comment on? Of course you can. Yeah, uh, what I was thinking that we can have a good network of national systems and international organizations. Yeah. Uh, in particularly in uh, our latest areas of research, wherein mm -hmm. we can contribute to each other's uh, what you call uh, needs and we can learn from each other, particularly in human resource development and utilization of resources available at various national labs as well as international organizations. Fabulous. So, so resource resource yeah. sharing would be the most important issue. Yep. Yeah. And that goes very well with Jemima's point. So thank you, TR. That's great. Yeah, I have a, yeah. a comment. I don't know whether that's a big point or not, but um, just to, to remark on this, uh, uh, I think uh, we now live in a time where in industry, which I'm a bit closer now to, climate change uh, is taken much more seriously than ever before. It's not just a, a greenwashing or social responsibility thing anymore. It is actually becoming more and more a business opportunity and a business necessity. Mm. Uh, I see this in my industry, in the fertilizer industry, which tends to be extremely conservative and resistant to change in anything. Uh, but the leading companies uh, that we have, and these are the biggest fertilizer producers in the world, have all uh, shifted gears massively just in the last one or two years and now are basically changing their business strategies to all put themselves in a complete and more holistic sustainability approach from the production of fertilizers all the way to the use and the consequences of it. And so and some of them have already started to implement pilot programs um, on carbon, for example, between in Canada. So this is, is a, this is not just a small change, it's a massive change that we're right. seeing in industry. Yeah. And it's also driven by uh, investors who otherwise wouldn't provide uh, money anymore to invest in new things. Yeah. That, very, that's really interesting thing. and important. And my guess is, is Juliana, you would yeah. have something to say that connects mm -hmm. with that. Yes, would, exactly. would you like I, to add to that? Yeah. Um, yes, I... With my experience, I, I, I was previously in academia and then I moved to the private sector and now I'm on the, on the uh, NGO side. And what I see is, is, a, is a great opportunity to scale up uh, the solutions through the private sector, yep. but a total disconnect about the research and what they are doing. So there is a yeah. lot of what yeah. they want to do and, and they want to, and they have an outreach that uh, is incredible, but not necessarily applying the best or the, the state of the art knowledge, not necessarily what needs to be done. So I think uh, the private sector needs to be invited to this dialogue and also the NGO community, because I think it's, it's basically uh, what I was uh, saying in the presentation, a, a shared responsibility. So we all have our, our, our share and um, we can't put this only on the, on the, on the farmers. And we, we have to say, okay, if the private sector does this, but that they do it 
in a way that is consistent to what the researchers ha have been producing because that's the, the, the real, uh, that's how it's, it's, it's done solidly and, and science-based and that has the potential to have a greater impact. Perfect. Thank you. Th those two points go really well together as well. Um, thanks. Sonia. Thanks all. Anyone else like to come in? Is that Anna Maria? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry to jump in. Yeah, uh, of no, course. Just Two small points. One is in relation to the Sustainable Development Goals Agenda, and we didn't mention that, but perhaps that's a link that we should mention and the importance of really addressing this topic in terms of being able to reach those targets. So just that one. And the other one that has been a little bit discussed now, it's, it's um, uh, the partnerships that you mentioned, Sonia, already, but the importance of uh, researchers working together with the different stakeholders yeah. from the very beginning in terms of the type of research questions that you would like to do because you know we discussed today uh, that there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of the modeling and so on and so forth but really being able to focus that those research questions into the type of solutions that we are looking for so i right. think it's really important to emphasize okay mm -hmm. okay i've got that uh, anyone else want to come in or would you appreciate just a few minutes break um now, because I, I know I'd just like to jump out for, for one second. Um, others may feel the same. I think we still have five minutes or so, so I think it's good. Is, is that okay? I'll, I'll, I'll be back myself in three or four minutes. Okay, thank, thank, thank you all. Um, in terms of any YouTube people, we're going to be taking a couple of minutes break and then we'll come back and have the feedback from the groups. How much more time do the, the groups have? They must have three or four minutes still, right? Tundi? Stephen, is, is anybody here? Just checking how much time we have still Tunde to come in for the groups. Tunde, is Tunde there? Yeah, I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing anybody. Let, let me check with Tunde and I'll let you know. Yeah, maybe he's busy on the WhatsApp. <laughs> May you send me the, the, the YouTube link so I can send it to the people in the waiting room so um, they can go to YouTube instead of being admitted. Okay, I'm sending it to you in WhatsApp. I'm not seeing Tundi on here, but I guess he must be here somewhere, right? We'll be coming back together in a few minutes, I believe. And then we'll hear back from the groups how they got on with their conversations. I have the feeling that IITA, that Tunde is not on this call anymore. Can that be? Tunde is still on the call, Peter. He's here, yeah? I don't, I don't see him in the list. Yeah, okay. I think he's helping other people in the groups. Some of them ah, are okay, that can be, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay. 
Yeah. Uh, some of them actually need more instruction about what to do. So if you can put uh, uh, the instruction in the chat again, that can help. Yeah. Links to the pages. Yes, and also the yeah. questions. Yeah, I'll do it again. I don't know, I think once, you, once you're in a group, I don't know whether you can see the main chat still. Let me have a look. I can see on the Google that about eight or nine groups are organized, they're typing. So just to run through, Peter, in, in this final part, you will say something coming out of the chat rooms, the breakout rooms, and then I will follow with some remarks based on what I've just heard from the speakers would like highlighted. Uh, I, I, of course, I'll be brief. And and that's and then I pass on to Val. Uh, you pass to me first and then I go to okay. Val. Yeah. Okay. And then that's it. Yes. Um, and I'm just going to ask people to share back from the chat what they what they discussed and what the key points were. Very simple. Some of the points are recorded in the slides. Um, in the Google slides, we have about eight or nine groups who have, have written who managed to get something down. But I'm hoping that everybody had a chance to have a conversation at least. So they should be coming back soon. I don't know. I'm, I'm I can't see Tunde here on our. I don't know. He's helping people, but we don't want. We need them to come back soon. Here he is. Okay. How much more time? They must only have a few more minutes, right? We have uh, less than two minutes. We have one. Okay, that's fine. That's perfect. Let them come. They just have to come. Yeah. They just come back when they come back. Thanks for going to help the groups. But the presentations were good. A couple were a little bit too long, but then a couple were a little bit short. So they balanced out perfectly, I think. From the group. Yeah, just from the presentations, yeah. And in a minute, everybody should come back. I still think we have 200 and something people still. 200, we have 200 yeah, I stayed at some time for other speakers. <laughs> I Sorry? Kept my, I kept my intervention short. I saved. Yeah, you were perfect, Schengen. Yeah, you gained time for your colleagues. It was good. People kept asking where your slides were. They kept thinking you have to, people are so used now that when you present, you have slides. And when you don't have slides, they were like, we have three or four right. people saying, where's this, this slide? This Please innovation. move this slide. Right, yeah. this is a new innovation, right? Yeah, much better. years ago, when we had in, at the East now, we, you know, we were going to use um, what the transparency is as 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 innovation, right? Yeah, yeah, I think it's good. I guess now it's... we don't use it. It's a new innovation. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, I can see everybody is coming back. That's very good. Welcome back, everybody. We're happy to see you back. Um, Stephen, can you move the slide, please? Can you move the main slides? Oh, there we go. Perfect. Very good. Welcome back, everybody. I um, understand that it was, of course, a bit challenging to dive into a very quick group work with some big questions. Um, so what I'd like you to do now is um, you've had a conversation. Some of you have written some points in the Google Slides. I can see some nice points, some nice things. Um, but obviously, not every group was able to post to, to capture the notes. So I'm posting now the chat into the into the chat. If you can, either from your group, did you have a most significant insight or conclusion? Can you please share it? Just type it into the chat. Um, if you're not, if you don't have a team chat and you just want to share what your takeaway message, your insight was, the discussion was, please share it here. 
We want to hear what you think. What are the most important research actions? What are the most important practical uh, intervention on the ground actions? What is the policy changes we need? And what do we do about gender and inclusion? What actions are needed? So please take 20 seconds. Think what your action is be. Thank you very much, James. You started it off. You're, job, you're welcome, John. Tell us what you think. Thank you very much, Vivian. Here we go. We want to hear your, what did you talk about? What were your main points? We're seeing knowledge gaps. We're seeing drought. Uh, CRISPR CAS9, that's a very technical thing. Great, very good. Give us the points so we can reuse these. We can build on these. Thank you, Vivian. Provide information to farmers. Yep, most suitable. Yep, okay. Please post what were your takeaway actions? And we're gonna give you another half a minute only. Just give us your main thoughts. Thank you, Victor. I can see lovely acronyms, more R for D on CC. Yes, bring farmers into research earlier, gene pyramiding, whatever that is, that sounds interesting. Keep on going, we give you another few seconds. Just share back with us because, you know, we had a nice opportunity to listen. We had a nice interaction in the chat. This was your chance to talk with some complete strangers, we hope, about what you think some of the most important things are that need to be done. Because this is the first in a series of four webinars. The idea is that these will come together and we can feed the main points into the, into the bigger, wider global conversation. Also influencing, we hope, the CGIR research agenda we have Sonia Vermeulen here, who is the big in charge of all the research of the CGIR. So she, all the, these are all good ideas for Sonia to take forward. Good. I'm going to let you keep on typing. Sonia, I'm not going to try to summarize these. It's really a very impossible task. So I would like to welcome you back. Um, let's leave the chat. Sign up. Um, chat up there. Sonia, would you want to give what you had a nice conversation with the panelists while everybody else was in groups? You had your own little group. Tell us what you guys talked about in your group, some key points that came out of it. Thank you, Peter. And as Peter said, while people were in breakout groups, the speakers also convened and I asked everybody what should be our key takeaways um, from today. And it, it comes to five points. So let me share those with you. The first is this is really important. We know that climate change is with us. We know that it's going to manifest through issues with plant health. And unless we do something fast and ambitious, we are not going to meet the sustainable development goals. So those of you who work on this know that your work really matters. Secondly, there's a big theme around cooperation. We need to be working not alone, but together. So coordination at the international level, but bringing together both national and international partners, sharing the latest ideas and also sharing resources. That's the second part. Thirdly, that research shouldn't just be among the researchers. We need to work very, very closely with the users of that research all the way through. If we don't co-define with them what the research questions are, we're not answering the questions that they need to answer. So we need to work very closely, for example, with uh, robust and inclusive extension systems so that the research that we do actually reaches farmers. And then fourthly, another huge opportunity is with the private sector. The private sector have shifted in recent years from seeing climate change as an add-on, um, an extra, a co-benefit, to being absolutely central to their business models. So this means we're seeing change at global scale and very fast pace in the way that private sector are planning what they do on farms and from field to fork. This is a major opportunity for research to step up and work much more closely with those private sector actors and also uh, with the civil society NGOs that they work with. So this leads to the final point. People were talking in the chat about how they found the webinar today empowering. Do please feel empowered. Your work really matters. Go forward, make it work, and please also come back and attend the next series, uh, the next webinars in the series. Thank you. Back to you, Peter and Val.
Thank you very much, Sonia. I tried to capture a few very few key points in the chat. Um, we're going to move on. Can we, Stephen, can you move the, sli the slides forward, please? We just had that. Here is the reminder. Here is the advert. Sonia just made it. This is number one in four webinars. We have three more. The next one is on 17 February, looking at germplasm health. The third, second one is third one is 10th of March, integrated pest and disease management. And the 31st of March, looking at one health. I guess that's people's health, plants' health, planet's health, animals' health. There's a way, there's a link there. Um, I don't, somebody, maybe somebody can post the link into the chat. Please register, please join us. Please bring the ideas from today and bring them for next time as well. And I think I'm gonna hand over to Val now. Val has been one of the, the, the leading of the co-organizers. Val, if you want to come forward, please. I think you missed a slide, Stephen, or did I miss it? Yeah. Val, Thank you. over to you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, on behalf of uh, the steering committee for this webinar, I would like to thank the audience uh, for your engagement, your insight, and also for the questions. Uh, special thanks to our eminent uh, panelists for the excellent presentation that we have seen today. I would like to uh, also present my sincere thanks to Sonia for moderating this webinar. I would like to thank the organizer behind this uh, webinar, especially the communication and the Zoom team, the Zoom team who, who supported uh, this event. Also allow me to extend my appreciation to the, the sponsors who help us to have this event today. So with that, uh, the first web webinar, uh, the first of the series is now formally closed. And I would like to thank you again uh, for your active participation. Thank you again. Thank you. A great event. Thank, Thank you, you all. very much. Goodbye. Bye bye. Goodbye. Bye. Perfectly on time. What great. Super. <laughs>